and that is Who Dares Wins, the legendary MSAS film starring Lewis Collins. Lou, yeah. Every man wanted to be him, every woman wanted to be him as well. <laughs> Lou, Lou was a lad and uh, uh, a great character and, uh, you know, he was the James Bond we never had. Mark, how are you, mate? <laughs> Living the dream. How about you? <laughs> yes. I'm firing. I'm delighted to have you on the show today. Great to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Well, I, I, I literally feel like the luckiest man in the world, mate, because I just get to meet the most fascinating people and... Um, and just have the conversations about stuff that I want to in it, like stuff that I consider not, not important. I mean, not every conversation has to be important, but they have to be more interesting than what, what soap opera, operas on the telly or, you know, <laughs> or just about football, you know, football's great, but, but, but when you got that mate that he only can talk about football, it's, it's like, dude, come on, you know, you, you've got children. <laughs> they <laughs> they want to know. They want to know other stuff. So, so absolutely brilliant. Shall we say a thank you? Um, so I should just say, Mark Ryan, friends at home, um, big Hollywood man, has, has uh, smashed out all the Transformers movies, as our American brothers and sisters call them, films, as we say in the UK. Also a former intelligence operative and, and also, which is quite relevant to the video that I did with John Hegan the other day, which I suggest everybody watches. There'll be a link below if I write it down to remember it, that is. And that is Who Dares Wins, the yeah. legendary SAS, the classic <laughs> all-time SAS film starring um, our all-round hero, Lewis Collins. Lou, yeah. Every man wanted to be him. Every woman wanted to be him as well. <laughs> Something like that, Mark, isn't it? But Lou, Lou was a lad and uh, uh, a great character. And, uh, you know, he was the James Bond we never had. Oh, oh, with all due respect to Daniel Craig, who I like, and to Sean Connery, uh, Sean, um, uh, and to Jason. Uh, Lou was the James Bond that we never had and should have been. Yes. I loved it when Daniel Craig became James Bond because he wasn't the toffee-nosed toff that for some reason the Hollywood had decided would represent James Bond because James Bond was a tough cookie he was orphaned at a young age, so he's, a, like a lot of us, a trauma sufferer from, from birth or from, from, from youth or infancy, I should say. And, of course, he was a hard man. Well, the books, uh, I, before we even wrote, we'll go off on a tangent. The books are actually brilliant. Of course, written by Ian Fleming, who was an intelligence operator during the Second World War. His brother is less famous but more, uh, actually more mysterious, uh, Peter Fleming actually worked directly for the London controlling section that was run by Churchill. So Fleming's older, smarter brother, Peter, was involved with some of the most strange and the most interesting intelligence operations of the Second World War. So Fleming drew a lot of that, obviously, that information and obviously the later information about Russians. But probably the best, one of the best spy book novels ever written is from Russia with Love. It's absolutely brilliant. Yes, I like the old James Bond books. It's very funny reading them now, though, because there's so much stuff you just, you wouldn't get away with as a novelist. And I've written two fiction books and you wouldn't get away from it from a, a political correctness point of view. 
absolutely yeah and that's yeah. The, it's very dated some of it like every time he meets an animal in a nature it's a it's a man killer when actually <laughs> no it dude that's just a fish you know it's a, a pretty pretty freaking tame mr fleming <laughs> but he was he was um linked to intelligence wasn't he Peter uh, or Ian. Ian. Yeah, Ian, sure. He worked for Naval Intelligence during the war. Mm. He worked with uh, um, If you want me to go off on this, I will. I mean, there's a lot of discussion who M is in the books. I prefer to believe that it was actually Sir Stuart Menzies, M for Menzies, who was head of MI6 or the Secret Intelligence Service, SIS. Um, uh, that's who he based M on. But there are lots of things in the books that still, still ring true today. I mean, the Q department, Q, um, a lot of the weapons that were developed were at the, the pattern room at Enfield, where I was a frequent visitor and borrower of, of equipment uh, when we used to do our training, but also to go and look at the weapons. And a lot of stuff that was developed and, uh, and kind of shows up in the Bond films was in reality developed at Enfield Small Arms uh, and by the Patent Room. So there's a lot of stuff in there which is based on, based on you know, fact. I was on a snowboarding holiday and I became friends with a, with a chap. Um, we're still friends to this day. And his garage serviced the James Bond car, the, the, the actual <laughs> original. And it, it, he... Gave me, he sent me a photo of, of him pushing the red button. Oh. Great, great stuff. I mean, you know, what a fantastic film franchise and great for, for Britain as well. But no, Fleming was a very interesting character and uh, uh, complex, right? But the books, like Who Dares Wins, because we're probably going to go back to that in a minute, Who Dares Wins was of its period. It was written for a certain time and place in British cinema. Probably couldn't be made now, that film, uh, today. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning, Eddie Farm. Sir. This exercise will take the form of a cross-country pursuit, terminating at the top of that. Easy. Now, you two gentlemen will be given a one-hour head start. Whatever. Better get going. Oi! I'll tell you when we get going. Better get going. Fuck, Smudge! They're already here! Oi! Get off me, you knob! You are shitting the professionals! Shut your mouth! I prefer Doyle. Right. Now ask one question. One question only. Now that shouldn't be too difficult. Sorry. What are you gonna do? Ask one question. One question only. How many questions? Ask one question. One question only. Or are you two alone? Can you borrow my phone? Are you two alone? What? Et, go home. Are you two alone? Give a dog a bone. Are you two alone? Pass. Give me one on sport. That's not the answer. Didn't hurt. <laughs> Didn't hurt. Didn't hurt. Can you scratch my nose? Thank you, I will. There they are, sir. Just down there. And Fleming's books, the original books, and some of the early films, Bond films, are of their time. You know, they look terribly dated now, but of their time, they were, you know, uh, groundbreaking. And certainly there's a lot of stuff in there, which is was prophetic in many ways. Yeah, so I'm just going to, if you see me looking, looking across, Mark, I'm not being rude. I'm, um, I'm just watching the horse racing. <laughs> no, I'm just getting up on the other screen some pictures that I can flick up for, for, people, for people at home. So you'll just have to trust me that they're all good and decent and it doesn't say Mark's a knob. <laughs> It's all right. People are saying that anyway out there, mate. Don't worry about it. Yeah, so just flashing a picture up of our man. Our man in um, Barbados, wasn't it? I think Ian Fleming retired too, because he, yeah. he used to be a big yeah. fan of spear fishing. Yeah, and he, he, his house was called Goldeneye. You know, that's why the film was called Goldeneye, because his home was called Goldeneye uh, in, Bar in, the, in the Bahamas. Yes. So before we begin, let's just give a special thank you to Martin Webster, 
Yeah. Martin was on the podcast the other day. It's a great episode, folks. We're, we're waiting to air. Martin was the chap who you might remember in the News of the World footage um, a few years ago was on top of a building in Iraq and he was filming with his camera uh, what looked to be a, an untoward beating of, of Iraqi civilians. Uh, and after my chat with Martin, I've just had a comp got a completely uh, different insight into that event. He, he made a film called The Diary of a Disgraced Soldier. Um, I'll put a link for it below where you can watch it online, folks. Very nice man. Um, and so, yes, so Martin, big thank you. Mark, can we go straight into who dares wins then? Well, sure, whatever you, whichever way you want to go. Yeah, let, let, let's go for that because I know a lot of our, uh, our viewers will be um, interested. I tried to get in the SAS um, and I failed uh, because I was too hard, but... Yeah. yeah, I can see that about you. You've got, you know, it's your eyes, mate. You know no. what I mean? Immediately. It's the one inch punch that I perfected, or is it the double that I, that's what, that's what it, frightens people. Yeah, well, it's, it's that or the thousand yard stare. You've got to practice the old thousand yard glare. That's, ju that's just when I'm, when I'm stoned. <laughs> I, I well, let me give you the background to this because um, I'm sure some of your uh, uh, listeners will be interested or, or not. But anyway, I was doing a show in the West End called Evita, and I was playing Che Guevara. And um, uh, I'm actually going to just change that. Oops, it's easy. I should have done that anyway. You can probably edit that bit out. No, that's right. We'll, we'll, we'll keep rolling. Um, and I, I was doing a show in, in the West End called Evita. And I'd already met Lou. I met Lou up in Manchester when he was doing the Cuckoo Waltz. So we'd been sort of pals on and off. And I bumped it. We kept bumping into each other at Do's in the West End. And um, during the day, my family, I come from a long line of military people. I come my, going back to my great grandfather. We served all over the world. My father and his four brothers, three brothers all served in the Second World War. I grew up in it with a history of people serving the First World War military medals and all kinds of stuff so um it was just a tradition in the family but i'd gone into the music business uh, and the entertainment industry and i was uh, but as we all did in those days everybody was you know wanted to do something serve somewhere all of my pals all my mates were kind of involved so we used to go regularly to the brecon beacons and run up and down the pen and penny fan and all that kind of stuff so we used to go up there and do that a lot um, and I'd finish a show on a Saturday night and we'd drive out to Wales and go up and down the mountains and run around the mountains and come back and go back to the show on a, on a Monday night. Um, and anyway, I actually bumped into Lewis Collins uh, in the Brecon Beacons. It's an absolutely true story in the middle of nowhere with Tom Conti and a bunch of other people and Ian Sharp, the director of Udez Wins. And we literally bumped into each other in the middle of somewhere. And... Um, we got chatting. It was raining, of course. We just did the chat. I said, what are, you, what are you doing up here? Why are you up here now? Because I knew he was involved with Ten Para at the time as well, um, which he passed, of course. He, he had his cherry berry. And um, he said, oh, I'm training for this film I'm going to do called Who Dares Wins. Ian's directed it. So I got chatting with Ian, Ian literally in the Brecon Beacons. And I said, he said, what are you doing? I said, I'm playing Che Guevara in a feature. He said, I'd love to come and see you. So Ian and Lou and their respective partners came to see Evita with me playing Jay. And afterwards, um, as we got towards more of the production of the film, Ian said, I'd love you to be in this film. I want you to play this character, one of the bad guys. So I said, okay, fine. So the last six to eight weeks, I think it was six weeks of me playing Shay in the West End, I would drive to Pinewood or wherever we were shooting and we shot my segments um, in the film. And uh, as I say, Lou and I remained friends all the way up to when I was doing Robin of Sherwood. Um, we'd been pals a long time and, uh, and had quite a few adventures. So uh, that's how it all came about. That was the reality why I got invited by Ian to be involved with the film. Wow, sorry, I was just going to get a picture of Che up there for our younger friends out there who, who um, 
might not have been bad, art, bad arch by the t-shirts that we were growing up. I've, um, I followed Chase story you know i followed it from argentina to to um cuba down to it was bolivia it was, it was executed in wasn't it yeah well it was yes he was off yes sadly I, I think maybe we we take that mark as maybe a podcast for another day because it's um i'm happy to talk about yeah any of that there's a whole show to be doing about just evita in the background of that i have spent four years in that in the west end yeah so. and i've been to um Buenos Aires and been to Evita's mausoleum, is that the right word? The big concrete yep. thing that they put families in. Yeah. Um, but getting back to who dares win. So, you know, Lewis. Yeah. How did you, you got to play, can we say the bad, I don't like to use the word bad guy, but I don't, yeah, that, that's what well, it is, right? I was, don't forget, so I'm playing Shay. I had a beard and long curly hair. And I know it's weird now because you're going to go, what, did you once have hair? And I once had a, a head of curly hair. And um, so I looked very, very sort of uh, Mediterranean-ish. So I was playing Shay Guevara. So I ended up playing Nazir and Robin and Sherwood. And um, that's also due to Ian Sharp. Um, and uh, he obviously looked at me and went, oh, he, he's going to play like a bad guy. You're one of the terrorists or something. So um uh that's our cast because of the way basically i looked and also i was obviously playing shay so um uh, i ended up playing one of the bad guys and lou was desperate to shoot me that is absolutely true he was st all the way through the filming was i'm trying to have it rewritten so at the end i can shoot you <laughs> which then became a joke um but i was actually shot by a stuntman called teddy forrestal who was also uh, in the Special Forces. And uh, Forrestal died uh, during a parachuting accident as his a base jumping accident some years ago. But Teddy was uh, uh, was the, actually the person that shot me in the face. But Lou was desperate to do it. <laughs> so he, but he never did. He never got to shoot me. Can we just, um, just, just go back there a sec. Did you say an SAS guy that died in a base jump? Yeah, Teddy Forrestal was a member of the regiment. He wasn't that chap that was on a documentary on the television, was he? I don't know. Um, which documentary are you referring oh, to? I was chatting the other day with one of my base jumping friends about this. I'm not sure if it was Mike McCarthy. Um, yeah, I can't quite remember. Well, there was two. Tip Tipping is, was one guy. Tip Tipping was a guy that was killed in a parachuting accident. Yeah, and I've had Andy Guest on the podcast who was um, in the Royal Marines free fall display team and right. they were um i was asking them if they knew i saw a documentary about 10 years ago probably 15 years ago now and it was an sas guy parachuting up there in norway where they jump off the cliffs in the in the yeah. base jump yeah and he turned he was turning to his mates and going do you know i don't quite feel right about it you know and there is a key a key sign of like where well, you shouldn't be throwing Should yourself be. you know yeah. and of course yeah, well, I say of course, but ultimately he this chap died, and now now that you mentioned it, I just wondered if it could be the same person. Well, it might have been because what the case was um, followed a, for a couple of days because what actually happened was he was brushed against the cliff face, he was forced against the cliff face by the the wind, and he ended up on a ledge, and he he'd already got two broken legs, uh, Teddy. Uh, from a previous stunt that went wrong from on a motorbike so he had he rebroke his legs and so he was on this cliff face but it was too windy to get a chopper in so he was literally on this cliff face um waiting to be rescued but they couldn't get to him and from what i understand he either decided to get off the cliff and try and open his spare chute or whatever, or he got, or he fell off the cliff. Whatever he slipped off the cliff face, and and he very sadly was, uh, uh, he was killed in the accident. Oh yes, it's that Teddy thing, Forrest. isn't it? It's better to die being a, you know, living like a tiger than it is to live live as a coward. Teddy was a Teddy was a good stuntman, and um, you know, as with all of these things, and I know plenty of people, Martin Grace, for instance, being a good pal of mine over the years martin grace was also uh one of the best bond stunt men ever he got injured quite seriously on a bond film and broke his legs um and 
you know, you, you, you want to go out shining. You don't want to go out, you know, with a whimper. And um, these guys understand risk, you know. And what I didn't understand about that was, and it does happen in this business a lot, you, you do a risky thing once and it works and you've got it in the can, hopefully. You've got it filmed. And then they'll go back, could you give us another one? And that is always when the accidents happen, is when you just go beyond that one thing of, of safety. And that is when, and it can sometimes be fatal. And Terry was a stuntman? Teddy Forrestal, yeah. Yeah, I'm just going to get a picture up. I've, I've got one here of him throwing himself off a, off a scaffold. Uh, I don't know if that's meant to be an explosion going off behind him. I'm guessing it is. Probably. That's either Martin Grace or Terry Forrestal. Yeah. Anyway. Fun, funnily enough, there's very few photos of him on the internet, which I suppose you expect from a stuntman because they're generally not supposed to be seen, are they? Or they're, well, they're, and all they hide their faces. You'll notice there's a lot of this going on. You know, yes. you'll see who dares wins. In fact, Martin Grace was the double for Lewis Collins in uh, Who Dares Wins. You'll see him a lot. We're, we're in the scene where I get on the bus behind Lewis. There's a scene where Lou then gets off the bus and he's almost run down by a car. But it's actually uh, Martin Grace, his stunt double. And the other scene where he jumps onto the boat, where he runs and I'm chasing him on the motorbike and he jumps on the boat, that was also Martin Grace. So, you know, that's the connection there is between the stunt guys, Martin Grace and, and Terry and, and, and Lou. And Martin Grace has done Indiana Jones, am I right? Yeah, did everything. He Let's did get a, lot a of picture things. of him up. He's got a very quintessential English gentleman look, hasn't he? Yeah, but he was Irish. Ah, uh, God, no. Very Irish. Hey, Martin, if there's very... anyone that puts their foot in their mouth, mate, uh, that's me. But, but don't, don't worry about it. Sorry, Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Look, there he is. Brilliant. Brilliant. So, yeah, so back, back to the film then. Um, what's it like to know Lewis then? I was going to say, what's he like? But that's, uh, I'm not into dishing dirt on people, but but maybe there's some stuff people would like to know about the the, the well, legendary you, side of his character, I'm, I'm, which I'm sure. Lou, Lou passed away a few years ago, as you know, and, and I think he made an interesting decision for an actor in his life. And, and, He'd done everything, you know, he'd, be, he'd been a big star with professionals, obviously, and he did Who Dares Wins, and then he had, he did some other films afterwards, and he worked on, he worked to, um, on films afterwards after Who Dares Wins. Um, but I think he got to a point where he wanted to break the mould and go off in a different direction, so he went to California and uh, started a computer business, and I think he did a few bits and pieces here and there and he did some fan conventions but really I think he became uh, a family man and he and Michelle have got the three sons and and he seemed very happy I mean we even though we were pals for over a decade uh, before he got married to Michelle um, uh, and we had lots of adventures and stuff we got into all kinds of trouble um, he uh, once he'd done that he, he kind of made himself a bit of a recluse and I was asked, I have been asked many times to write stuff uh, for his aut various autobiographies that have been attempted. And I've always said to the writer, do you have Lewis's permission to do this? Um, and they went, no. And I said, well, if you get Lewis's permission, um, I'm happy to tell you stories. And I said, but I won't if he doesn't want it. I mean, it's different if it's coming from me because it's my personal impressions and experiences and I'm free to talk about my experiences with him as a bloke. Um, but I don't want to write or speculate about anything else about it because I don't want to spread. I wouldn't want to be seen to be spreading. This just came up recently with an interview I did about him. You know, it's uh, why anybody would think I would do that. I don't know. No, Lou was um, a, a complex man, um, uh, but actually in a way simple man. He was very fun loving. He was very full of uh, jolly japes. And actually uh, a master of comedic one-liners and timing. And I know people don't get that from him, probably in some of the work that he's done, but he was a very funny, fun-loving, you know, big softy, really. Um, and I think he probably, uh, like all of us do at some point in proceedings, said, OK, well, let's find out if I could be a para. Let's find out. 
So he did do his full para training with Tem Para. Um, the man that trained him was a personal friend of mine called John Newman, who was one para. And uh, when, when they were up at Finchley, which I've slept on that drill or floor once or twice, and uh, Lou passed P Company and he, he got through and he got his cherry berry and he got his wings. So I, I respect him for that. I respect anybody that's done any service, that's thrown themselves in or volunteer. I never have a bad word. Uh, uh, tip for anybody that's done that unless they're being stupid in which case then you just got to say look mate you know wind in mark can you know, i but... just chip, chip in here i mean no disrespect to anyone it's just not who i want to be but we did have a subscriber the other day he said he didn't actually pass his jumps course he 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 i think injured his leg on the third jump and the guy that was writing this knows the uh, the ds on the course so the staff i'm not trying to be controversial i'm just trying no, to no, acknowledge no. the the chap out there that that said that, that that he sounded like he knew what he's talking about is what i'm trying to say but well ask him this this person you can ask him if he knew color sergeant john newman b-e-m and I know from John that he did get his wings and he went back and completed the course and did the seven jumps. Yeah. Now, there may be some, uh, as I've heard myself, I've heard everything, even people from my side of the, the, the business. I, I've had every story from, oh, Lou got beaten up in the Special Forces Club and was kicked, got the shit kicked out of him and all that and got thrown out on the street. I have asked people in the regiment do you know this story? Have you ever heard a story about Lewis Collins getting beaten up in the Special Forces Club? Because this bloke said it, and I don't believe it, because I don't think Lou's like that. And he said, I've asked people, and they've gone, never heard that story. But you can ask Rusty the story about him going to Hereford and them having a few jars in the bar, if you like, at Hereford, because that's a true story. I know that's a true story. So a lot of people have got stories about... Um, what they think they know about people. I can only tell you what I know. And so I was told by John Newman that he completed his course, he got his wings and he got his berry. Yeah, and, and everybody knows if if 2-2 SAS try to rough up Lewis Collins, he just turned around and beat them all up. <laughs> I've seen the film. I've, I've seen the film. See, you know. Yes. Lou could handle himself, don't get me wrong. Lou, Lou could handle himself. Lou was very physical and he knew how to throw a punch. And uh, he certainly wasn't backwards in coming forwards, you know. And like a lot of people, I'll, I'll just name drop because it's true. Um, Ray Winston, all of these guys that have got that persona um, uh, in their film career, doesn't mean they go out looking for trouble, but people go looking for them. People want to go, oh, I beat up Bodie in the pub or I beat up Bodie in the club or whatever. And suddenly from what may have been a bit of pushing and shoving and a bit of, you know, sharp words, turns up, oh, no, he got the shit kicked out of him. Well, I can tell you the same thing with Ray. Ray knows how to throw a punch. Ray box for England. So Ray knows how to throw a punch, right? Uh, Lou knew how to throw a punch. Now, he may well have got a bit leery and he may, so he may have been asked to leave. I don't know, but I've never come across anybody who told me that they kicked the crap out of him. It's, you know, I, I kind of had the, the, the same thing a little bit, but it's usually just online chatter. People don't know you, you know what I mean? They assume they know you because they've seen you. But Lou, Lou I, I, I've not heard that myself. Shall we just clear up then? Not, not that it's our job to, and again, not that I really care, but did he pass sele SAS selection? Is that is that the rumor is friends at home um, that Lou passed SAS selection, uh, whether that be through the reserves, uh, I'm, I'm guessing through the reserves, and then was denied a place in the regiment because of his fame. Well, I think a lot of it comes from the misunderstanding of what that means and so let me uh, let me clear that up first of all he went on selection for 2-1 SAS which is the reservist element artist rifles they now a different role uh, than what they did originally during this period they had a different role in Europe than what they have now but 2-1 SAS uh, he went on selection for 
And my understanding is he per, he passed the first phase. It's like anything. It's like people think you become a member of the intelligence corps and they just hand you a wall for PPK in a tuxedo and say, off you go, you now speak German or something. Off, you know, it's not the way it works. Mechanically, what uh, happened from Lou's own mouth to me was that he passed the first phase, which was probably the, the beacons phase, the physical phase and running up and down phase. Because the next phase would have been jungle he would have gone to Belize and he would have then gone through a, 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 a resistance to interrogation phase, which I don't think he got up to. I think he got up to the first physical phase and he passed that. And that's when they realized that having Bodhi, you know, if he ever did actually, he couldn't really fulfill the role because he would have been, he was too high profile. He told me that himself. And he said that one of the PSIs came to him and said, mate, you, you're too high profile. Everybody knows who you are. We, we'd love to carry on and it's great. It's been great for the lads to work with you, but it, it just is not going to work because you, 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 everybody knows your face. I guess we should point out we were doing a lot of work in Northern Ireland then, weren't we? And Well, 2-1 wasn't. Um, the, 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 actual, the reality of it is, is that a reservist can work um, for uh, the British government in war zones. It's, it's a fallacy that TA soldiers don't, don't serve overseas. They do. And in the old days, you used to be able to take what was called an S-type engagement, which basically meant you were temporarily made a regular soldier. And so you became, like in the Gulf War, there was plenty, of, trust me, there was more than uh, reservists than you would imagine serving in the Gulf. And there was more reservists serving during the Bosnia campaign. People don't, I know people don't think this, I know reservists don't, uh, regulars don't like it, but that's true. The truth is the British Army cannot function without its reservist element. That's a fact. It's a pure fact. And under now, under recently what the changes, the British Army more than ever cannot function without its reserves. So 2-1 um, uh, had a role, which was in Europe in those days, um, which... It's probably it's a matter of public knowledge now, but if you've ever heard the expression Gladius or any or uh, Gladio or any of those operations where left behind troops were spread all out over you know Europe to take on the Russians from behind, that's what their part of their role was, part of their role. So it's changed a bit now. So, but Lou was a British, you know, uh, married, housewives' favourite, and so he probably he was just too high profile. He told me that himself. And to be honest with you, I think he took it on the chin. I don't think he was bitter about it. You know, I think he was kind of like, I get it. I understand, you know. Um, uh, so that's that's the story that Lou told me. I mean, I'm sure there's plenty of other people out there that are going to come up with, oh, he's wrong. That's not the what, whatever. I can only tell you what Lewis Connors told me himself. Yeah, I, I sympathise with him because did I tell you, I didn't get in the SAS. Um, yes, you did say that. Yeah. But, you know, but, but it is a lot of it is about if your face fits and you can ask Rusty this, you can ask any of the boys this, there's a lot of personal, um, what can I say? Choices are made about who they think the, the whole, have you ever heard the expression, the gray man? Well, that's a, um, that's a very often quoted term, isn't it, with respect to getting into the SAS? Or the intelligence corps. Being the grey man, don't get noticed. Yeah. Don't get noticed. And, um, yeah, being the grey man for the regiment is very important. But it's, it's also true for in corps and various, what is now the, the Special Reconnaissance Regiment. I mean, that thing, be the grey man. We don't, get, don't stand out and don't, well, Lou stood out. <laughs> he was fit I can tell you that Lou was a very very fit man yes it's also I think what we don't know what we don't realise about celebrities especially in this sort of X factor culture where you can be a hairdresser one day and to, next day you're a, you're a number one selling artist is these folks They've done this from a very young age. They're incredibly talented, aren't they? Most, most actors, if you put them in an opera or theatre or music, they can sing, they can dance, they can do impressions. They're, they, they're, they're 
quite funny. They have a, a that can we say they're in touch with their feminine self, which I, I say is a positive thing. And yet here's here's this guy that's got got all these qualities that I've just mentioned, but also that he can smash it out with the SAS. Now, I respect him for trying. I really do. I respect anybody that tries uh, and I respect anybody that's gone through any of the basic training and have put themselves into uh, the firing line. It, it's, uh, uh, I think we all do it for various reasons. And uh, for my, I say, for, for me, it was, a, it was a looking back at the family tradition. I didn't really have much choice to just volunteer. It was, was one of those things. But um, no, the, Lou, Lou um, uh, is sometimes is maligned. Uh, but for most people that knew him and knew why he did it, I, I think we all have respect for him. Yes. I'm wearing my Adidas top in um, in homage to Lou today because <laughs> pretty sure he wore one of these in the professionals. He always was quite cool. So uh, I can tell you this, who dares wins? And I know this from people in because I, I, you know, I lived in California now for, you know, like I have homes in a couple of places, but I, I lived in California for 25 years. I still do. And uh, obviously, you know, many people in law enforcement and in the intelligence business, their security business, who dares wins is studied, was studied by uh, everything from the intelligence community to law enforcement in terms of the psychology of it, the techniques. I know SWAT cops um, that studied it for the use of the flashbangs, which in those days were completely uh, a new <laughs> distraction devices. So, um the whole thing of MP5, uh, I shan't really, well, I could, I'll say his name, Phil Singleton, who was Mr. SAS um, MP5 uh, representative around the world. Um, he, uh, a lot of people were like, no, that, everything from the weapons to the, ta to the tactics, to the psychology of the, the Stockholm syndrome, everything was used in, in that film was studied by people in the business. Wow. How how well, guys? You can go so deep. These I love these conversations. How how well was the film received? Um, well, it was kind of a mixed bag because I, I think again, and I, I, I'm not. I don't need to defend this. It was a film of its time. If you recall, there was a big thing because Margaret Thatcher did two things that were sort of you know very British. One was sending the, 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 the task force down to reclaim the Falklands Islands and the other was obviously the Iranian embassy siege. And it was a tough decision to make, but it was the right decision to make and everybody got behind it and went, whoa. So that was a that was one of the reasons that the film was made. Uh, and it wasn't meant to be jingoistic in the sense of, you know, you know, it, it was uh, it was meant to follow on from a film called The Wild Geese. The producer that produced Who Dares Wins also produced Wild Geese. And so it was supposed to be that, you know, a type of film that appealed to a type of audience at a certain time, which it, which it did. And um, you've got to see it from that point of view. Although we got a, it got a lot of stick because for some reason, they apparently used a CND um, sign during some of the filming of the crowd at the beginning of the film, there was various signs, peace signs that we used. And I don't think the writer, George Markstein, who I met, who also wrote The Prisoner, uh, and I can bore for Britain about The Prisoner, um, uh, it intended it to be a slight on CND or the peace movement. It was actually meant to be the symbol of the disrespect for the peace movement by people that were trying to use it for different meat, different reasons. So it what it was to show a the juxtaposition of the peace movement um, against the idea that we should be able to defend ourselves and Britain should be able to defend democracy. So it wasn't having a go at CND. It was trying to say the other side of this that the argument is that you can have peace and as long as you are be prepared to defend yourself that's great but if you disarm us we can't defend ourselves you will get abused and so i think that was part of the message that george was trying to say in the film um and it got twisted into no whether we're bashing cnd which we weren't at all how did military 
but so how did the SAS take take this film? Do they do they do they take it as legendary? It was was it scoffed at? Was it how was it at the time? I think the best review is by Rusty Thurman, um, who went through the film, the techniques, the actual house clearing mm. techniques that the, the, the are practiced at the killing house. A pretty, a pretty spot on, actually. You don't forget these are the days we're running around with a respirator, an S6 respirator, and a Browning eye power. Um, this was all revolutionary stuff. It had not never been seen before, and the use of flashbangs and distraction devices that were first used uh, in Mogadishu, I believe, um, taken out by the regiment to, to this concept of having a distraction device, the flashbangs. That was all new stuff. It never been done before. And it was a tremendous risk. The actual raid itself, people go, yeah, but it was so well planned and all that kind of stuff. It could have been, but there was a lot of unknowns. And the unsung heroes in that situation were actually the negotiator. I've, I've met Trevor Locke. I've talked to Trevor Locke. So I know what the situation was inside the actual embassy. And the actual VZ-63, not the Scorpion, but the other Czech machine gun that one of the guys had, I've handled that weapon. So there was a lot of risks that were taken in terms of, and they, the regiment carried off that raid brilliantly. So I think the film itself was seen as a, um, the techniques and everything were, were seen as pretty spot on. And at the end of the day, Lou did go to Hereford and did go to the Killing House with Ian Sharp, and they studied the techniques and put it into the film. So there's a lot of stuff in there that people go, like even the wall imploding, where we end up being shot. I got shot in the house in, in, in the Muse. That where they implode the wall, you can talk about whether it was physically possible to do that or not. But the removal of the bricks to put in the listening devices, again, I know where those actual listening devices are. Um, that was all real. They actually did that. They actually removed the bricks so they could get listening devices through the walls so they knew where people were. So there was a lot of it technically, which was spot on. Yes, it's interesting. Um, I read somewhere, I've read a fair bit about the SAS, the formation of the SAS, uh, Colonel Main, so yeah, Pat, Paddy Main. Um, I like, I, I'm not a warmonger and I'm a, I think there's better ways, let's say, but I do like reading the old military stuff because it's I like real life I like to spend my if I'm going to read I want to read real life stuff because there's so much exciting stuff out there and um, I did read somewhere that a significant proportion of SAS operations go tits up basically which if you think of the nature of what these men are willing to do they're all willing to not come back aren't they which is a brave thing in itself and by this i refer to all of our all of our armed forces um but the embassy my gosh it 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 all could have gone so wrong couldn't it i mean there were things that that didn't go to plan they say no no plan survives first contact with the enemy um with the enemy we we had the guy hung up on the rope which was just unexpected he's but but on fire on a rope um when that charge went off in the famous bbc clip it almost looked like it took the guys out and then it was it was a significant amount of time before they got back in through that window certainly enough time to execute most of the hostages um and again i mean there's no disrespect i'm just saying that that this it, it could have had a very different outcome, couldn't it? Well, one of them, as we know, um, had an RDG-5 Russian hand grenade, which he didn't, he didn't pull the pin on. Mm. It wasn't until later on that he was coming down the stairs that one of the lads saw that he had a grenade and whacked him on the back of the head with his MP5. And then he, got, then he, was, then he was shot because he was trying to pull the pin out. But if he'd have pulled that pin out in the room where the hostages were, as soon as he heard that first bang, there would have been lots more dead hostages. And he just didn't do it. We will never know why. You know, we don't know why. I, I think I know why, because, again, I've 
I got some insights from Trevor Locke about his battle with Aoun, the number one terrorist at the back, when the guy put his foot through the window. Um, and a lot of that is to do with the Stockholm Syndrome. And uh, anyway, if, if he'd have pulled the pin on that grenade, which we know he had, or they'd have picked up the little submachine gun that they had and decided to execute people, it would have been a very different story. Yes, and I... Um... Yes, very much, and I've had Robin um, Horsfall. Yeah, Robin horsefall has been on the podcast, I think, three three times now, and he was one of the chaps at the bottom of the stairs that put some rounds into this this uh, unfortunate gentleman. Um, and also, we're going to get Rusty. Uh, well, as you know, because we've both just been speaking to him, but <laughs> he's he's um, he's going to come on soon and. He's quite aware as to uh, the defence landscape, let's say, where, where, where we're heading as, as Europe. So I'm keen to, to probe, him, probe him there. But back to the film, Mark. <laughs> what, 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 were there any bloopers on it? Were there stuff that went wrong? Were there any accidents? It, it was quite... Did, were there any um, service personnel that did the stunts or is that all taken care of by stuntmen? No, there were advisors or from women. the regiment on the set. Eh? I, said, I said, I did a blooper. I said stuntmen. You're not allowed to say that anymore. It's stunt, <laughs> stunt persons. Or stunt performers. There were um, people on the set and hanging around, let's put it that way, uh, usually in the bar, but uh, where I was with other people, um, who were serving with the regiment at the time. That is true. Um, I won't, they put anonymous at the end of the film, so I won't name them for various reasons. Um, but there were people involved. And as I say, Lou did go to Hereford and was, was guested around uh, uh, and shown around and shown some of the techniques. So there was a certain amount of cooperation uh, with the filming. Um, although the stunt team themselves was run by a guy called Bob Simmons. Bob was one of the original James Bond stunt coordinators and he coordinated the action per se in the you know, little bits of stunts that we did. And obviously we had the choppers, Ministry of Defence lenders, the um, uh, little scout helicopters. Um, there was a couple of times when things got hairy, particularly up in Snowdonia when we were filming the scene, because I was up there with Lou during that period. Um, Ian had got them on the edge of a cliff and Morris Roeves, who uh, is the officer that jumps out of the helicopter. Wow, that chopper pilot, I believe his name was John Cowie, but there was actually more than one chopper pilot. But anyway, the weather was atrocious and how he managed to hold that Skype, that scout helicopter on that edge, I don't know. He did a tremendous skill. And I remember they only tried it twice again because Ian was like, we don't need to, we're not trying this again. And um, Morris almost fell out of the helicopter. <laughs> he almost fell out of it. And he told me afterwards in the bar, he said, I was terrified. He said, literally, because he suffers from vertigo, he thought he was just going to fall out. So he was riding the skin, hanging on. And he was literally hovering above, trying to land this helicopter in this gale. And um, basically <laughs> fell out of the helicopter. <laughs> and uh, we got away with it, though. But, but. Other than the actor that got that got his nose broken um, during the interrogation scene by accident, Lou landed a punch on somebody, um, and uh, it, it was it was a pure accident. There was nothing about it. He just clunked the guy in the wind, and he had a big hood over his head. And you can look if you look carefully, you can see the difference in the body shape um, of the guy in the hood and and, and the smock. Uh, other than that, really, there wasn't really any any damage there was nobody injured seriously mm. i'm just going to chip in here mark and say for friends at home if you haven't seen this film and you'd like to i'm going to put a link uh below this video where you can buy the dvd so treat yourself have a saturday night in and um watch this classic mark i'm conscious of your 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 valuable time so let's um I'm, I'm good. You can go as long as you like. If you want to chop it up, whatever you need to do. Good man. Good man. So, um, should we talk about the, the ink core, your work sure. in, in, in that? And if you can give some examples of any daring do that, that goes daring on? Do. or 
Well, I'll, I'll let me. I'll preface by doing this. My, I, I, I don't regret anything I did with the intelligence corps, and I learned a lot, uh, and it gave me a lot of experience. Which later on, when I moved to California, because of my then clearance, I ended up becoming a licensed private investigator. So I was a security consultant and a PI for twenty years in California. I got to work with a lot of people, so I owe a lot to the intelligence corps, and. Um, I guess it was kind of a unique situation because the company that I was a, a member of um, had some very interesting jobs and were support to a lot of interesting areas of the defense world. So um, one of them uh, was support to the special forces. And one of my endearing memories, uh, you being a Royal Marine might, you know, uh, uh, get this, was um, serving with uh, Paul um, on HMS Fearless in a Force 10 gale, and we lost uh, contact, radio contact. We were bobbing about in the North Sea, and we lost contact with the entire squadron. <laughs> and, uh, for 24 hours, everybody was panicking like mad, going, where are they? And as you may or may not be know, they have a, had a couple of special boats that were designed for certain tasks very expensive and very fast anyway we'd lost them couldn't speak to anybody and um there was a certain amount of panic going on and uh i remember being what was called then there was the head shed on the uh, on the superstructure of fearless and the literally hms fearless used to corkscrew through the water like this it didn't go up and down like that it didn't go from side to side it corkscrew and I uh, had to go to the loo in the middle of the night, like 3 a.m. in the middle of this storm. And normally I would have gone through the bridge and down into the superstructure. But uh, as I walked towards the bridge, actually on the deck, fearless, trying not to fall overboard, um, I saw that the bridge was full of people with gold stuff all over and hats and all that kind of stuff. Um, and Navy ships were retiring broken from the storm. So I thought, oh, I better not go in there. That looks like it's very serious. I'll go down the ladder. So I ended up crawling down one of the superstructures ladders of the boat. Um, and as I was crawling down the ladder, Fearless rolled like almost at 45 degrees. And all I could see was the North Sea below me, literally. And as I was hanging onto this ladder, I thought, don't let go, you or they will never find you. You are destined for, to be fish food. So I was hanging onto this ladder. And as I was hanging onto the ladder, as you do in these moments, I saw this line of effervescence going off behind the back of HMS Fearless, disappearing off into the moonlight. It was this of, like almost lit pathway following the boat. And I looked and I went, wow, that's what, you know, the effervescence of the ocean, I've never seen that before. And then I looked a bit harder and it was actually boats, little boats, little inflatable boats, and some not quite so little inflatable boats, all trying to follow HMS Fearless. So I climbed back up the ladder and I went back to the edge and I said, is there any news on the chaps that we can't get contact with. And they said, no, we've got no radio, we've lost radio communications. I said, you better come with me, boss. So we went out the back of the boat to the helicopter deck and I went, I think that's probably part of your squadron <laughs> trying to get back to the boat. Because I'm not being funny, the waves in the North Sea and a Force 10, you're talking 20, 30 foot waves. So these guys were out there bobbing about for 24 hours, desperately trying to get somebody's attention on the back of the boat. And um, at that, I remember looking at that and going, you guys have got, you've got hearts as big as lions. Hearts as big as lions, man. Because I would not want to be out in that sea, in those conditions, in an inflatable boat. Can you, I mean, anyway, so that's one of the little stories I tell about, you know, my respect for guys that get out of C-130s in parachute in the ocean and jump in a rubber boat and they'll go tearing about. I have a lot of respect for them. And Sorry, Mark, I, I missed the beginning bit because I was trying to get an image up. Did, did you say that was the SBS? Yes, cool, uh, yeah. Yes. It, I won't yes, name the squadron. I won't name the squadron because I don't want to, you know, for them to be embarrassed by what I just said. No, but it's... It brings it home, doesn't it? Playing on the ocean, it's 
it's such incredible adventure, Whoa. but it's also bloody deadly, isn't it? So it separates the men from the boys, I'll tell you that. I mean, even if you know what an ISBO suit is, maybe you, if you ever got to have to wear an ISBO suit, an isolation suit, when you've been transferred from A to B, just trying to wear a rubber suit, an isolation suit with all your webbing and your kit and your, everything else strapped to you, that alone, and you're looking down at the ocean, is a, a sobering thought. Because well, this is the, the thing I was going to mention about the, um, the modern role of our, of not just SF, but all, all forces is you could see that the clobber the guys had to wear at the embassy was a lot of things, you know, pistol here, knife here, grenades here. Anyone that's ever worn a respirator will tell you your vision is so limited. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you, and it's so hard to breathe. As soon as you start puffing, it, it becomes really hard work. Um, you just want to take the thing off. And yet now you've got guys doing the same thing with a bloody laptop strapped to them. GPS, uh, infrared goggles. Okay, guys, I'm being a bit, you know, uh, uh, I'm being a bit inventive here, but but people get what I mean. It's it's the 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 amount of kit that the modern soldier has compared to back in the day, and you still got to have all your basic, you know, all your basic kit. Yeah. It's um, and you've got to climb up and down ladders and it weighs so much. You've got body armor on for a start, which they didn't really have so much back in the day. No, um, you didn't have a 10 pound ceramic plate, you know, in, in the front of you or, or behind. No, the, the amount of kit that people are carrying now, um, as opposed to, say, the Second World War even. I mean, you know, your basic infantry soldier is carrying, you know, 70 or 80 pounds worth of kit, let alone before they start getting handed mortars, you know, bombs and shit like that to carry as well, and all your ammunition. You know, it's 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 a miracle you can even stand up, let alone, you know, fight in any of it. Yes, it is. Just before we m move on, Mark, sorry, I just wanted to get a... See if there's a more modern um, photo. What did you think of... Um... The film then six days uh, i thought it was pretty good i know um it got a bit of stick because it's only telling one story from from one point of view but that's all the film was trying to do i don't think i know he got some stick from some of the other lads and i guess that they felt that their story wasn't represented in that film because it's seen as a a, a group effort and um uh but i don't think the film was uh trying to show that it wasn't a group effort i think it was just showing one bloke's experience and, and one story because they only hit one floor as you know the different teams hit different floors and had control of different areas so that you know basically they had their own kill boxes where you go that's your floor that's your floor that's your floor that's your job bang and so um he was telling his story from what their experience was on that floor and what they what their job was um so i didn't think it was a bad film you know um there's a lot of look as you know in the military there's a lot of not just very dark humor but sometimes there's a lot of not i wouldn't say backstabbing although there is i suppose but there's a lot of you know people want to tell different stories in different ways that's why i don't get involved with that when people say you know luke on has got beaten up the special forces club i go i, I don't i've never heard that story and I've never talked to anybody that, that has heard that story either and or from the regiment. So, you know, um, I don't really, I, I, I don't believe it. I've had some of it myself, mate. Trust me, I've had some of that myself. People want to snipe and they want to have a little go because they see you, you know, having a different career or talking about other stuff. Uh, it's water off this duck's back. I'll tell you that I don't give a monkey's what anybody thinks about that. I don't care. Say what you like. You know, I know I was there. I, you know, I mean, I was on fearless, so I can I can talk about that. I can talk about who dares wins. I, what anybody else thinks of me, of what I say about it, is irrelevant. Let's come on then to um, black sales, and and we talked earlier a little bit about the history of of piracy, sure, and, and the links to modern Freemasonry, sure. 
Well, you know, the pirates, as you know, were, were, were originally pirates. They were privateers. They were actually given a charter by Elizabeth. Oops, hello. That's my agent, probably. Hello, Mum. <laughs> yes. Huggles, too. Huggle, snuggly buggle. Yes, yes. Yes, I had a big breakfast. Yes, I am full up. Yes, no. No, I'm not playing with the big boys. Don't worry. All right, I got, I got to go, Mum. Love you. Bye-bye. Sorry, that's Mummy Kim. She just, she likes to check up on me in podcasts just to, uh... sorry, go on. <laughs> no problem. So, uh, yeah, the history of, of pirates is it grew out of um, private, the privateers who were given a charter by Elizabeth I to raid anybody, basically, the, the Spanish and mainly the Dutch, where I am at the moment in the Netherlands, um, and anybody that challenged the, the British naval uh, uh, presence around the world. And they were given a, a, a charter to attack and steal and rob and sink anybody else that they wanted to. Once peace broke out in Europe and we were peace with the French and the, and the, and the Spanish, um, suddenly those people that had gone around the world doing that became outlaws and then they, they became the, the pirates. We actually mentioned this very briefly in um, uh, Black Sails when we are talking about um, Edinburgh and the powers that be in Edinburgh uh, and about our friends. It was all to do with the Scottish royal claim against Elizabeth and all that kind of stuff. Um, but it... Uh, that was the background to it. And but these very, very skilled sailors that literally sailed around the world in these small wooden ships and managed to navigate, you know, around the world uh, suddenly became outlaws. So they went working for themselves. So the, the pirates themselves, the whole thing of the cross bones um, flag has a, a long tradition within linked to the Masonic tradition. Um, Elizabeth used various people i mean walsingham was invented the first intelligence group if you like and in fact the intelligence corps badges are, are the two the the house of lancaster and the house of yorkshire the the royal rose so the the actual history of intelligence gathering goes all the way back to walsingham and very much to john d of course the occultist who um, had a mirror from which he basically said he could see the future. So he was forecasting technically, tactically, what he thought the Spanish or the French would do. But really, he was, he had a, uh, uh, it was the first deception operation because he wasn't seeing into the future. He had a network of spies in all the royal houses. So he was being forewarned of what the French or the Dutch or the, the Spanish were going to do before they did it. So that's the basic of the history of all this. And because I guess the Masonic tradition is secretive, if you like, it was seen as a natural adjunct to intelligence type things because they, they had their own codes, if you like. They had their own ciphers. They had their own language in a way. Um, and that, it grew out. And that's where piracy grew out of. Can we, can we start then... Um without getting too complicated, because I don't want to, to lose people that are not familiar with this history, but how does it go back to the, the Crusades um, and the Knights Templar and Roman, the Roman Catholic Church and this kind of, this well, kind of narrative? Well, the Templars obviously grew out of the Cistercian monasteries in Yorkshire, which there are several massive Cistercian monasteries. And uh, the Templars grew out of the Cistercian tradition. And around York, where the Exchequer was kept during the 11th, late 11th, 12th century, um, there are seven Knights Templar preceptories. So Britain was very much involved with the whole Knights Templar uh, thing in Britain. Obviously, the French were as well. It was throughout Europe. But in Britain, um, their role in terms of... Uh, moving money about was that money was deposited in York at the Exchequer, the Knights Templars would give you a bit of paper, you would go on your crusade or on your pilgrimage and you cash that in. They invented the first cashier's check. 
They were also, though, tremendous uh, merchants, and they had a very strong relationship with the assassins. We talked about this in Robin of Sherwood, where the assassins, the assassins, um, had a trading relationship with the Knights Templar, and they exchanged things like the astrolabe, the navigation device, the astrolabe was an Arabic invention, which then the Crusaders then adopted for their own naval navigation processes but medicines hospitalers they traded a lot of esoteric ideas about various spiritual things going back you know hundreds of years thousands of years so there was a big exchange of information between the templars and various esoteric arabic groups during even during the crusades but the templars owned massive fleets of ships which they traded and sailed the oceans with which suddenly kind of just disappeared once they were excommunicated because the catholic church wanted to remove them as a, a lenders of money to royal houses in europe which they were um the templars lent all the royal houses including uh, the english royal house um lots of money and people wanted to not have to pay them back the money so they all went along with the idea well let's excommunicate and take all their treasures and then we don't have to pay them back and that's what happened um in, in england as well um uh one of the men who is buried in the temple church in the temple in london which is named after the Knights nice temple in london the temple in london is named after the temple church which is there and uh, a lot of famous templars are buried there uh but um the the royal, the royal houses owed them lots of money. And this was the best way to not have to pay them back that money was to excommunicate them. And of course, the um, Catholic Church, the Pope's papacy in Rome went along with that. Yes. Yeah, so you had the knights in the Crusades. So going into the, the Middle East to fight for um fight for Jerusalem. I'm just trying to keep this really simple to fight basically against the Arabic world. Um, obviously Jerusalem being a, a, a hot spot, whoever controls that is, well, let's, let's just not go there. But then on their return, they were tasked with overseeing the building of cathedrals and, and as such in, in, in Europe, which is, my understanding where they picked up a lot of the Masonic esoteric um, knowledge from the stonemasons, hence, you know, obviously Freemasons, from the stonemasons that were making these magnificent buildings. Then round about this time, the Roman Catholic Church, as you said, ex outlawed them. And so they spread, they, they, they fanned out, as it were, hid in the monasteries, which is why there's a link between the esoteric symbolism and and in and certain monasteries. I'm on thin ground here, but I'm trying to I'm trying to keep it going. But like, what, what, um, and then a percentage of them took to the high seas, and the it's why. Today, you hear talk of Skull and Bones, which is Yale's Freemasonic Society, of which, gosh, it seems pretty much every American person of note is, is a member of Skull and Bones. So John Kerry, the Bush family, um, et cetera, et cetera, all the... Donald Trump. <laughs> yes. So, and... Um, yeah, it says a lot about democracy, doesn't it? When the, the global leaders are all members of secret cults. Well, let's let's just back up for a minute because I think can I can I just finish the point I was getting to is that the symbol of uh, skull and bone society is the skull and crossbones. Yes. So, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, um, but let's back up for just a second. Let's go to, to uh, Montsegur, where one of the one of the last Templar strongholds was Montsegur in uh, in uh, Cathar country, and the Cath it's called Cathar because that was the Cathar religion, which was a, a, a um, or spiritual uh, element of the Christian Church. The Cathars at Montsegur were 
most of them did their last stand against the crusade but instigated and paid for by the church in rome for instance they had things like women could be priests they were very forward thinking the cathars believed even though it was a, a templar um, stronghold that um, women could be priests they could own property which they weren't allowed to do we don't forget in this period women had a lot of power within this and uh, the pope in rome and the uh, Pauline thought didn't like this, it didn't agree with them. So that was one of the other reasons. It was empowering women in many, many ways. And so um, that was where the one of the last battles actually took place against the Cathars, and they were all wiped out, they were put to the sword. So there was a crusade paid for against another Christian group that had a slightly different view of Christianity, kind of somehow reflected today in many ways, uh, in some issues. Um, so once they'd actually uh, disappeared, yes, some of them went back to the Cistercian monasteries. Now, for instance, Fountains Abbey in Yorkshire, which I visited many times, has on its, I guess it's the right transit of the church, a huge green man figure on the outside of the church. So on the outside of the actual abbey, there's a huge pagan green man face right it was there originally built why was it allowed well because the old christian church didn't see satanic demonism stuff in nature worship it was all part of a spirituality and in fountains abbey the green man face on the outside of the church goes through the window and inside he turns into an angel so as an advertising ploy the abbey when we understand you may have reverence for old traditions and nature and all that kind of stuff but in here you're welcome because it's all part of our spiritual belief system it doesn't matter whether you believe this or believe that it's we're all creatures under god so come into the house of god and in that particular one not that we know now um the angel is holding a what we believe is a a dated thing where the synod of whitby changed all the dates of the pagan uh, uh, like christmas and easter uh, to align with christian dates and nothing to do with christianity easter's got nothing to do with Christ christmas has nothing to do with christianity no you know we're talking about the midsummer the midwinter solstice it has nothing to do with when jesus was born it's the mid it's the midwinter solstice december 21st the coming of the new sun yes Gosh, it gets very deep. I've got a, a, a chap I watch a lot, John St. Julian, that's very good at explaining esoteric language, uh, as in the scriptures. Yeah. It's fascinating what, you know, here people think Mark of the Beast, and they, they think, oh, it's this chip that people are going to have in this microchip that's that will come. I'm not, I'm not saying the microchip will come. There's people who have already volunteered for it. Um, but... It's no, it's it's a reference to the mark of the beast is a number, the number nine. And depending on which way you come from it, whether you come from the light side or the dark side, it's numerology. And it symbolizes whether you live in your beast yourself, so your devil, you know, whether the devil controls you, or whether you you're you're in control of your spiritual self. So the uh God or whatever people want to call that that power for good in the world that it's when you believe in the devil. I mean, I don't believe in the devil. I don't believe the devil as in the Christian tradition exists. Mm. Devil simply means stranger in a lot of languages. And so the idea of Saturn, Satan, Saturn, as we did talk about earlier on, the devil to me, I've seen the, the the devil's work, if you want to see that, alive and well in human beings. I don't need to I don't need to believe that there's some supernatural creature out there doing this it, human beings and men can do quite the most horrendous things to each other you don't need a devil to provoke that it's within the human nature to actually do the most evil uh, deeds i don't believe we need um, to create a, a demonic creature you know what i mean to do that so just my personal opinion yeah it's quite fascinating because um it, it, this is the whole thing it, it's all supposed to be confusing because while everyone's confused about it and everyone's saying, well, I've got a God, oh, I've got the devil, oh, no, I know, it's esoteric, oh, it's the sunrise, it's, it, it, it's, a, it's a huge, 
I wish I knew a cleverer word. I'm gonna say conflagration, but that's not the right word. It's a huge well, it's a huge mixing of all those things because it's supposed to confuse people. Meanwhile, but, while you're all confused, you're divided from your pure spirit, you know, you 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 and I give an example when you're when you relapse on drugs, which I've done several times in my my life. Uh, oh, my God, you see it clear as day. And if you wanted to use a metaphor, you'd say the devil's got me. You, you right. physically feel that feeling that you are out of control of your life and the dark forces of bloody got you again they got and you see your life disappearing because you see your relationships deteriorating you see your health going you see your moral structure of what you there's no way you'd have done a certain thing this week but this week it's just become you know the 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 norm and yeah i i mark as you can probably tell i find the whole thing absolutely fascinating i can see why it it's been simplified to a God and the devil. You know, uh, Polarities of it. Can, can, I'm going to give you a quick five Polarity, minutes. that is the word. That... Let me give you a quick five minutes on recovery. I, I spent, I was licensed private investigator and I worked with the company. In fact, I still own the company. I spent a decade of my life working in recovery in Los Angeles. So I've worked with everybody that is famous that's had drug problems in Hollywood. Just about everybody that you can think of some of them are no longer with us and some of them have survived and gone on and you never even know that they had a, an issue with substances. But I spent almost a decade literally chasing, rescuing, working, sitting, working out with a lot of celebrities and getting them out of the, the trouble they got into with substances. So to me, yes, it's a very difficult thing. And I'll tell you one quick story because it is true and it was about the bottom. You've ever, you, you've been in recovery, have you heard about hitting the bottom yes hitting rock bottom right let me tell you a quick story so i've been sent to new york to try with another guy to try and recover a very very famous celebrity uh we were guested by uh, actually sting um, and his wife because they were trying to help us because they knew the situation trudy trudy styler thank you very much indeed for your support in these areas um uh and we couldn't get this person, but they'd already apparently got on a, on a plane and already headed back. So I was heading back to Los Angeles to go back to the recovery place, um, which I think has now been taken over by somebody else. And I, and I was picked up by one of the guys. We were sitting with this, this gentleman back in this uh, in this van going back to Los Angeles. And he said, oh, he said, you're a normie. I said, yeah, I'm a normie. He said, OK. I said, can I talk to you about that? I said, Sure. He said, so we talked about being a normie and about having a glass of wine or a few beers and being able to stop and all that kind of stuff. Is a, nor is, is a normie, is that, that means someone who's not experienced addiction, is it? Well, it means somebody that has a normal tolerance for anything that other people think is addictive. So, I mean, for instance, I can have a glass of wine, I can have half a bottle of wine, then I can stop. I don't need to wake up today and need another bottle of wine or, you know, whatever. I don't, I've never smoked a joint, never smoked. I've never been interested never done any drugs at all in my and when i was being cleared you will understand they were fascinated by the point that i kept saying i've never done any drugs they were going you must have done drugs everybody's done drugs i said i drink i've had a drink i've even been drunk i admit to that it's not illegal but i don't need a drink every day so i i just have a glass of wine with dinner or whatever it doesn't worry me if i don't get another glass of wine for six months it wouldn't worry me Right. I'd rather have a cup of tea. So anyway, he was asking me about that. Mm -hmm. So I said, can I ask you a question? He said, sure. I said, I hear a lot about the bottom and, and I just want to clarify it because I. I <coughs> it. He said, sure, I'll tell you about my story. I said, he said, I was in South Central. I was um, delivering my last deliveries of drugs for the day. It was a Friday night. I was dealing. So I was in my Cadillac with two of my friends in the car. We'd sold a lot of stuff that day, delivering stuff. And we, so I got a lot of cash and I've got some drugs left over for us because the whole point of selling the drugs is so that we have money for our drugs for the weekend so that we can get loaded. I went, OK, I understand that. I've heard that story before. So he said, we're in my car. I'm in the back of the car. I do my last delivery, get the cash, get the stuff. I'm sat in the back of the Cadillac. I've got two guys riding shotgun, one driving the car and the guy, you know, being the guard. OK, so we pull into this alley. 
And he said, I'm sitting with two guys I went to school with. Now I've got a bunch of money and I've got a bunch of drugs and we're going to party, right? He said, these two guys in the front of the car that I'd known all my life turned round and emptied their weapons into me. He said, I have a bullet hole here. I have a bullet hole here. I have a bullet hole here. He said, I was shot five times. And they dragged me out of my own car, took my money, took my drugs, left me in the gutter to bleed to death and drove away and stole my car. I said, so there I am lying in a gutter and I've lost my car, my drugs, my money, and two of my best friends just shot me. And I said, shit, that's, that's the bottom. And he went, that wasn't the bottom. It got worse from there. And I went, I don't need to hear anything else. I said, that, he said, that wasn't the bottom. So, you know, I worked a lot in this area and some of the people that have made it and I celebrate the fact that they made it and they got clean and they have good lives and the people that didn't, you know, I, I, my heart, I couldn't do it after a while, to be honest with you. I had to, I had to walk away because I was losing people that were talented, smart. I cared for them and I couldn't save them. We couldn't save them and nobody can. They can only save themselves like you. As you know, the only person that saved you in the end is you. You have people around you and support you and help you and guide you. But at the end of the day, it's your decision. Yes. Yes, very much. We say drug free on this show, mate. Not clean. Okay. Drug free then. Sorry, not a lecture mark. It's just people need to understand there's nothing dirty about having a mental health condition. Uh, no, I mean, we, they, they use it in LA because of that connotation it comes uh, from it comes from the 12 step program we know that and a lot of the language that comes from that program as much as the good work they do they they tear they tear a lot of it down by stigmatizing all of us with mental health by using words like clean so the connotation is that we're dirty so that, and, I, and, and i i got it from that I got so it from they, from they, they make this polarity that it's a decision you make one day and then you have to be substance free the day after for the rest of your life it's a process and yeah exactly so it, and it's a very clever process and there's a lot to be learned and gained from it which which we overlook as a society um the only issue i'd say there is if if you're dying and your children are being abused that can't be happening those two scenarios and then the 12 step program his that's that's I'd say that's a good option then, right? But for, yeah. the, for youngsters that are just dabbling and for it it I just I toughed it out, mate, you know. I toughed it out on my own, no help from any I'm not saying anyone else follows my story, you know. You 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 guys live your lives. I I'm just talking about my situation and um and yeah, I can't complain how it I can't complain how it all worked out and I have, I have respect. I have a very good friend that I worked with who um, was seriously alcoholic and he came from a, a line of alcoholics. And I, we talked about this as we're having this conversation now. Mm. And I said to him, how did you do it? He said, I just, I did one day decide I want a life and I want a career. I just have to stop drinking. And again, I said to him, I said, well, define this for me. He said, I'm not like you, right? If I had a glass of wine, I want a bottle. If I have had a bottle, I want another bottle. And then I want another bottle. And I will not stop until I'm unconscious. And he said, I'll get up the next morning and I want to start again. He said, it's just a difference. It's in my blood. And so I said, and you, what did you do? He said, cold turkey did. Just made that decision. He said, maybe one day in the future, I'll be able to sit down and have a glass of wine with you, but I can't now. And I, went, I would totally respect that. And I respect the fact that if you did the same thing for you, it was your decision and I respect it. Yeah, no, I've never, a lot of people jump to conclusions with me and they, they, they say, oh, Chris is back on the meth. And I just tell them the truth, mate, I, I never stopped. You know, I, I, I never had an issue with substances. In fact, to be honest, I don't want to talk too much about them because a lot of it, you know, there was a lot of negative, but there was also a bloody lot of positive. There, there is a reason people do them, right? What I had an issue with was 
was that my childhood trauma, which was never, ever diagnosed, never dealt with. I was allowed to go into the military and carry a machine gun as someone that had come from a seriously damaged childhood, right? Which is, you know, you, I think you wouldn't, probably wouldn't get a shotgun license if, if, <laughs> if you knew a lot of our state, state of minds. I don't mean out, outwardly, I mean what we're, what we're going through on the inside. And, um, and that childhood trauma I masked it as an adult with substances. I didn't know I was in. You know, I just thought I was drinking with the lads or I was going to a rave or a dance party and isn't this great? And But I knew that I liked it too much. And of course, that's because unbeknown to me, I've spent uh, 25 years of my life living with trauma and I didn't, I didn't know it because nobody talked about it. Doctors didn't understand it families brushed everything under the carpet so you've always got this feeling that's in, an invisible feeling that you're different you know life's different for you things just everyone else's clothes look better than yours you know they fit them better everyone's family just looks after them better everyone's school comes easier to most people you know exams i couldn't pass exams i couldn't sit in school mark you know i was just to me my school was looking out the window and i loved it it's all i did i just looked out the window and dreamt of, of traveling the world and going on adventures and and um yeah sorry i'm not sure how we got to this point but we were talking about recovery yeah and and for me it was you know, getting balance back in my life is all I ever tried to do. When I had my moment of enlightenment, which, which for some people might be, um, or my epiphany, you could say, which set me on the path, I believe, to enlightenment. Your epiphany is your point at which your life is the lowest. And then you suddenly realise why it's so low. You suddenly realise what you've been, you know, or what your addictive psychology has been telling you, and it's been it, and it's and it's been wrong, and it's that that moment that that people know they've got to change. And the great thing about that moment is you never can go back in that thought in your head once you decide to change. You 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 might lapse, relapse, da da da. It's, it's kind of normal. Um, but but my point to people is 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 the substances is never the problem there's always been beer around there's always been a weed that grows in a field there's always been laboratory technicians mixing up chemicals in a lab that's that's always here it would always be that that's not the the issue is internally is your temple yeah is it something like that mark am i i'm kind of making sense aren't i roughly no, I think of all the conversations I've had with people, you know, about these things, it always stems from usually probably from some kind of childhood trauma or some a thing of self-worth, or you use the word masking uh, of something that they believe that they, they may not even be aware of it until much later on. So the whole re recovery process literally is a step-by-step. -step. And yeah, I sure, I know people that have, seen you know i need to do something and they've relapsed or they've had another thing but but it's a process of rebuilding um and for some people it's a very difficult struggle and some people don't make it and i know people that haven't made it and that's that is it's tough that is tough working in that business i have not again i have nothing but respect for people uh counselors and people that work in um recovery uh, that hang with it and stay there um, and and see three put people through because it, it's a very tough, emotionally challenging thing to do. You've got a very human side to you, Mark. I'll tell you that, and I thank you for it because when you are down in that position, you need people like you. You know, not not people not people that are going to judge and tell you what to do because, like, I've been trying to do. <laughs> it's like my well, mate. Fine. To go back to Martin for a second, that's why I supported Martin's uh, this latest film because it is about post-traumatic stress trauma. Um, 
and about soldiers coming back from Bosnia and or, for instance, the, the, the sandbox where we've we've got soldiers in America that have done nine, ten tours. They've spent most of their young adult life and well into their uh, uh, you know later adult life in war zones. And we used to base it uh, on the Pacific figures where a man can spend 30 odd days in a combat environment before he's emotionally traumatized for life. But we've had guys that have been there, both America and Britain now, they've been there for like four or five tours. Well, that's going to take a bit of recovery to get them, and, and they can deny it, and they can say, no, I'm fine, don't worry about it. But really, that um, flashback, which I have witnessed myself of a, of a, of a veteran having a flashback, uh, a violent flashback due to post-traumatic stress trauma, I've been the victim of that myself. Um, uh, I'm not a victim, but I was, you know, I became the focus of the flashback. Um, it, it's very real. And we are not dealing with that well at all, both in Britain and in America. Uh, it's it's people don't want to talk about it. We It's a bit more open, actually, funny enough, in the States than it is in the UK. But we need to have more support for veterans, particularly after uh, this last, you know, uh, decade in in. Um, in Iraq and uh, Afghanistan and various other places. I mean, Bosnia was the one that triggered a lot of people for lots of reasons, but, you know, we don't need to talk about that. Yeah, anyway, I'm supporting that. I'm supporting Marty's project because it is it is about that. Yes, it's very fascinating. Just to chat with Martin, like we did on the podcast, it, it it's a whole narrative that most people will never understand. And, it's okay, not everyone's supposed to understand everything in, in life, but it, it is integral to the whole narrative. If, if you're one of these people that thinks forces are heroes, then you need to understand trauma. Right. The, the dry, you know, the, the, you need to understand, you need to understand that these heroes that are putting their lives on, on the line in, in whatever, and, I, and I, I, I know the last 20 years are, are, are not really... A, a, a good example but but folks get what i'm saying and many of these people joined having experienced childhood trauma they then get it compounded by the experience in the military and then you leave and find out that you were just a number and no one cared you know you you feel no one cares about you on top of that you get pressure of stuff like bills mortgages payments jobs dealing with a boss social media paying your trying to pay your bloody phone bill uh, through the complicated technology that you get now and and that all that that stress of the trauma it rises up absolutely you start self-medicating with alcohol because temporarily that just, just gives you it just, just pushes this shit away from you the next thing you know you're doing that every night then it's then then, then the cycle starts your life falls away from you your partner says Honey, I love you, but the kids can't be seeing this. I'm taking. We're going. We're going to their nans. So suddenly, you've lost the one thing in your life that 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 was good. That's your children, you know, and and and, and your your girlfriend or your or your wife. Uh, on top of that, you're a you're a square peg in a round hole because you you always were right. This is why we're we're experiencing a veteran suicide epidemic. The, these oh. Are, oh. And, 22 a day at one point and on in, top of that imagine if you you know you've been sent into a com a theater of war you've had to do the ultimate in in acts let's say and then you find out people like tony Blair just laughing at you because they played you all they played you all along and they've got fucking mega rich off the back of 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 your soup, you know, what's going to be your you taking your life or people coming back with no legs, no eyes, this kind of stuff. Yo, it, if you hero worship the forces, you need to wake up. And, and, and this this is the stuff you need to get a grip with. We need to take responsibility where we're sending these brave young men, men and women. And then we need to take responsibility when they come home. That's the more important, even more important. Yeah. What no. a great conversation, Mark. Thank you. No, you're welcome. I, you know. Yes. Yes. 
Good. Right. Let's, <laughs> let's move. Let, let, can we just talk? Um, um, bum, 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 bum. Bum, 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 bum. Gosh, you're, everything you, you, you've experienced in this wonderful life, mate, is just fascinating. I think we're going to have to do another show because it's, it's too much. To, it, it's going to, we're going to lose people if we go on for too long, which is a shame because I know that they want to hear this. But let's be honest, in this modern day and age, now that we're out of the, uh, the, the you know what period, people aren't going to have three hours to watch this fascinating chat. So probably going to do it in two parts. Let's it into two episodes. Yes. If you want to talk about Transformers, if you want to really get some uh, uh, people going, you can talk about ATIP and UFOs and I'll talk about Transformers. <laughs> What, what's the connection there, mate? Well, um, obviously, Transformers is about aliens. It's about a uh, an alien race, which is a mechanical race. And I was asked about this at a convention. Somebody said, well, Transformers is about toys. I said, no, it's about it's about consciousness. <laughs> and they're like, what do you mean? It's about, well, the aliens or, 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 auto, or automated machines that have a spark, i.e. a soul. And then people were going, <coughs> well... It's going to become more and more open that there's something going on that the US military, the Department of Defense, know something that are not telling everybody else about. And of course, last week, there was yet another a release of a film uh, by the American Navy of an unidentified flying object or, or, or a, 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 a unidentified aerial phenomena um, that they go, we don't know what this is, but it looks suspiciously like a, an aircraft that doesn't belong to us or some kind of vehicle that we don't know what it is. We can discuss that if you like. But um, in Transformers, we talk about an alien presence on Earth, which doesn't look like a human being, uh, and it's actually mechanical. It's a machine with its own consciousness that can transform itself into different mechanical shapes. So... Um, the more we talk about Transformers, we, 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 we're really talking about uh, the phenomena of alien intelligence and consciousness. So um, shall I just clarify for our friends at home that I, you think I'm talking to Mark, I'm actually talking to Bumblebee. Yes, Bumblebee. This yes, is, very proud friends, of This is Bumblebee in the Transformers. Me. And guys. No, yes. Yes. Can I give you my take on it just quickly? Because I, I like to be the voice of reason because there's so much um, confusion, pur purpose. There's so much order out of chaos, can we call it? It's, it's yet another distraction to take people's focus off the money supply. You know, everyone argues about religion, colour, black lives, aliens... Uh, celebrities do, do, doing this, which, which you know, a, a lot of this plays a function, but the, the main thing that the, uh, the powers that be don't want you to focus on is the money supply that, that keeps us all enslaved to them. Um, so I have no doubt we're going to get alien stuff coming out in the media because it's just another thing that's just going to divide the world and... You know, these people are masters at, at, at this game, divide and conquer. Leaders have been doing it for thousands upon thousands of, of years. So that would be my take, Mark. Are you, you're not going to tell me now that you're a, a what, what do they call it, a believer or, or something like this? Oh, I, I certainly think there's a very interesting spin on why the American Department of Defense would have said these are real gun camera pictures uh, of taken from an F-18 Hornet, Super Hornet, of an object that we don't really understand what it is and where it came from and how it moves. Now, that may be true or not. I happen to believe the opposite of that. I think it's very likely it's something that we've developed and, and, and are flying, and this is some kind of psychological deflection um, thing. I, I, I agree with you in that sense that it's a deflection uh, from possibly an awkward truth, which is that the uh, we are further advanced in these scientific discoveries than we know about because of the money. Exactly what you just said, but for a different reason. I think that possibly that the technical side of what we are capable of doing is so far at strips 
oil and gas and the, our present, the way we control society and cultures at the moment, which is all based on petrodollars and all that kind of stuff. If we discovered that there was actually a, a, a source of energy that was free and cheap and clean, all of that would go out the window. So the city of London would be out of business probably overnight. So I think there is a certain um, element of deflection and distraction look over there look over there I'm, I'm just showing people at home guys there's there's kind of like a glowing clue in this picture do i get to see the picture though <laughs> I'm, I'm just flashing it if cnn and cnn are behind it or fox or whoever the network is it's it's not in your best interest folks to believe in it I, it's that's my take on it um you know these are the people that have just brought you 20 years of slaughter in the Middle East and, and no disrespect, but you all fell for it. Um, now they want you to believe that there's little green men that are going to come and bomb us in our beds. And <laughs> it's, uh, it, I don't think they want you, they want you to believe that, but you know what I mean? Uh, I they do. Yes. Yes, well, we, we've had all the X-Files, haven't we? And the, what do you call it? What is it when they take you up to their spaceship and they... they oh, you mean the, the anal probe. That's, yeah, they that's... Probe, probe you with things and all this sort of stuff. It, can, we say, can we say anal probe on this podcast? Yes, yeah. we can say... I think, I think there's a lot of distraction oh, going on. For lots I didn't of... mean that word, actually. That actually means to probe someone anally, doesn't it? I meant, I meant okay, you can say blimey if you like. I didn't. I didn't hear the word, so I, you know, I didn't hear what you said. Oh, something. Or something. <coughs> I'll probably go to um, to YouTube jail, mate. So I'm not going to say it again. Cut it out. Bleep it out. You'll be fine. Um, no, I, I think there is distraction in it. But anyway, the Transformers. The whole point of the Transformers is about a alien sentient race that comes to for refuge. Uh, on planet earth and makes its its home here and ends up defending and in many ways the robots themselves the transformers themselves imbue the best uh, and the worst of of human character for instance optimus prime is seen as this father protective figure of of the autobots bumblebee and i've been asked this again about the character and asked what why bumblebee is so popular is because he he is an embodiment of everything which is kind and fair and loyal uh, 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 um, in human nature. There's many things within the character that are very human. And the, for me, one of the great successes of the franchise was that they were able to take these basically digital models, because we only ever built um, one actual robot. So we only ever built one Transformer, and that was Bumblebee. And he's at the studios. He's at Paramount Studios. Um, and he was too big. He was two and a half tons. A mate of mine, Chris, built him. And he was two tons of car parts, and it took too long to move him around the set. So everything else is CGI. So it was, to me, it was a miracle that they were able to imbue these characters that you see on the screen that are actually there. Uh, I have to imagine that they're there when we're doing the dialogue with whoever it is, with Anthony Hopkins or any of the actors that are there, um, uh, and Mark Wahlberg or any of these guys, you know. Um, we, we have to imagine that they're there and put them in the, on the screen in our heads. And uh, they managed to make these characters, particularly Bumblebee, very human and very relatable to their 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 sense of 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 loyalty and their sense of of caring is very similar to human traits and even the awkward ones the ones that have got you know um ratchet and all these different characters have human characters that we can relate to so that's one of the reasons that the franchise was so mm. successful i mean five films a decade i ended up being on the set uh, with michael bay on and off um you you know what I'm going to ask you to do, don't you? Oh, God. I'm going to be cheesy, um, cheesy host. Got to do the voice, mate. Come on. I've got, well, I've got I'll, Bumblebee up on the picture. I'll jump him up and down as you're talking. Oh, permission to speak, sir. I wish to stay with the boy. That was Bumblebee. One of the other ones which was always got a laugh for me was I was in the studio one day doing this character and, and Michael looked at me and said, who is that? I said, it's my mate, Ray Winston. He went, oh, I thought I recognised that voice. He said, do it again. I went, 
Behold the glory of the jet fire. <laughs> I'm a mercenary doom bringer, you know. So I, I was like doing, I was doing Ray, Marky. How are you, Marky? What's going on, my son? How are you? When are we going to get together? Hey, come on then, come on. Okay, what's going on? Um, so I was doing Ray Mondo for Jetfire. Uh, but I also, I've done, all, on the set, I've been everybody. I was, I was Optimus Prime. I was the Lockdown. Lockdown was my favourite, the Lamborghini. Bumblebee was was a great character to play, and I, we had a lot of fun with Bumblebee. Um, but is he lockdown, honestly called Lockdown. Huh? He's honest. His name is Lockdown. Correct. The character on the fourth film was the Lamborghini. That was the one of the most interesting characters. Actually, uh, was Lockdown, and Lockdown was the um, basically a bounty hunter that hunted the other Autobots through the universe, and he was a very cold mercenary um amoral character that didn't care about the autobots or the decepticons um and in fact his first line is um autobots decepticons always causing a mess wherever i go in the universe is he the dude that looks like an advanced version of robocop um he sort of was a big sort of um he had a green face with a gun that came out of his head and uh and a, and a hook and uh he flew in with his spaceship he had his own spaceship which he rounded the universe capturing taking prisoner all the autobots so they could all be returned back to their home planet so a uh, lockdown was a um was a fascinating character to play and i think it's actually one of the fan favorites you know you humans always making a mess and then i have to clean it up Friends at home, if you're watching, tell me if the chap I put is this lockdown. What are your <laughs> thoughts? <laughs> and um, good kudos, mate. I mean, you know, smashing it there in Hollywood. Five blockbuster uh, uh, movies. There was, um, I got, I got approached by. It might have been CNN actually. Uh, Anyway, some media companies wanted an interview because while Molecule Bay was in Hong Kong f filming one of the one of the scenes that took place in Hong Kong, um, a load of Hong Kong triads rocked up on the set and started yeah. dem demanding protection money. Yeah, yeah. Well, they were they are my old bosses. I w I worked for the fourteen K when I lived in Wan Chai. Uh, I was only a or the limit, I should say, of my experience was I was a nightclub doorman for them. <laughs> but of course, I'm kind of the closest link the media's got to that world in, in, in or, or, or I certainly was at that time. And they, they, they used to phone me up for interviews about, or they'd, um, there's, a, there's a game called Sleeping Dogs. It's very realistic, actually, it, but it's all triad gameplay set in Hong Kong. And uh, I was the, I was the promotions guy for that. So I did all the interviews. You know, Chris, how does this game compare to working for the real triads? My God, it's it's so realistic. It's unreal. <laughs> but yes. Um, sorry, we got went a bit off track there, but are, are, you're obviously familiar with that when this extor this attempted extortion that got it got huge. Yeah, well, but it didn't go anywhere. And to be honest with you, the Chinese government were more concerned about how the film looked and what references there were to the central government than there were about the Chinese triads in Hong Kong. Like, let me tell you, there was more there was more of that about the Chinese government and threatening to sue them over the use of a, a, a hotel. You know, it's like anything that Paramount, everybody thinks that Paramount are just going to write you a check if you threaten with anything. And, you know, without putting without putting too fine a point, too fine a point on it, the film industry is a bit like the mafia in its own right. So trying to threaten Paramount was a little bit like, uh, no, guys, you don't you don't understand. Um, anyway, the Chinese government got their way and a line was added into the film to, to protect them. But I, to be honest with you, I think they is perfectly capable of, of aiming somebody off the set anyway in his own right. He's always got a, he's got a security team with him run by my mate, my old pal, Harry Humphreys, a top man, give Harry a quick plug. So Harry has always got guys around the set, 
you know, uh, looking after people. But Michael's not that type of guy. He's not somebody that's going to go, here's 20 bucks, disappear. He's, he's not like that. He would have. I think he hit somebody over the head with an air with an air uh, um, cleaner or so or a fan or something. Somebody came up and threatened him with a knife, and he smacked him over the head with a <laughs> with something. You know, pay you do that. He's the kind of guy. Kind I of heard guy. something about that. Yes, yes. I'm just flashing some pictures of me in Hong Kong up on the screen. There we go, guys. Just to keep you all interested. Not that Mark's not riveting. <laughs> I can't, I, but I can't see. See, I can't see your screen. So hey, you'll have to watch your podcast, mate. Oh gosh, I have to sit through it. If you slip like me that. a slip me a tenner, I will. Um, I'll send you a link for it. Okay. Well, that's interesting. Working for the China, I liked Hong Kong. I I, I enjoyed my time there. So, uh, but it was after after the Chinese had taken over. So the garrison there had been moved out, and it was all now you know, filled with Chinese troops and stuff. But I have to say, when I was there, they stayed out of the way. Now I know they're much more involved and, uh, you know, there's all kinds of unrest and sh stuff going on, but it wasn't when I was there. So right. it was in that interim period. It was a garrison. There's lots of things going on in, in Hong Kong. In Tamar Barracks, it would have been um, a ship's company because it's a HMS Tamar, wasn't it? Yeah. It was the, yeah. was the historic... Exactly. Navy building there. I did go down to look at it because I thought, well, I wondered what if they demolished it or something. But I actually went down there just to look at the garrison, just to say, well, I've seen it. I was never in it, but I, I, I wanted to go. And it's still there. It's still the historic building that it was the last time I was there anyway. Yeah, I'll get a picture of it up. Um, I I hid out there my first few trips to Hong Kong. I used to um, smuggle myself in just flash my ID card and I'd go and stay there for free, which in, you know, Hong Kong's not the cheapest, uh, not the cheapest place in the world. Let me get, let me, there's not, there's not a very glamorous picture of it online. Um, you do yeah, so I used to go and stay in, in Tamar, which is pretty much central, isn't it? If you, yep. if you know Hong Kong. Yeah. Um, until the time the adjutant, which is a which is an army term, folks. So it all gets a bit confusing. But the adjutant found out I was stowing away there, and uh, he said, "Report to me right away, through. Do you understand?" I said, "Yes, sir. Of course, I understood." Whether I reported to him right away was a separate issue, as far <laughs> as I'm concerned, and I. I literally ran out of the place with all my rucksack. It's all in my um, my book, Eating Smoke, Fo Smoke, folks, which is one of the books up you can see up here, or, or you can in a second. And uh, yeah, I ran away from HSM, HMS Tamar with my Bergen on and my briefcase in my hand, and and that was it. I was out of the British military for for good then, and uh, on my own two feet. And we all know how that panned out. <laughs> 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 oh life you gotta laugh so mark listen absolutely fantastic um let's come back another time because i'd like to chat che guevara with you sure uh ray winston mk ultra which is a fascinating topic that's the cia uh, monarch project isn't it the the um yeah, mind the, control. the brainwashing mind control thing with the, the the butterfly symbology it was though officially acknowledged and apologized for by bill clinton i mean he did actually come out and go yes we did do this it was it was a crime and, and well we apologize if, if you think about it they have to do that because they can't admit to it still going on and well, that's a different conversation. Yes. But the notion that what they came out and said is, oh, yeah, we did have that project in the 50s, but we discontinued it. Right. Well, if you were able to brainwash people in powerful places, so the heads of state in other nations or Hollywood celebs, whatever people in, in positions of influence, like you're really going to ditch that program. <sighs> I. I'd be a bit sceptical of that, Mark, but... Well, well, there's a conversation to be had. Uh, have you ever heard the expression V to K? V, v to K. K? It sounds like a comedian. V to K. No. V to K. Yeah, what does it mean? Voice to skull. Uh, 
enlighten do me. Research, do some research, and when we when we chat next time, we'll talk about it. Okay. Yes. B two K voice to school. Uh, you're giving someone homework that hated homework. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's the subject. I've been approached to do a new TV show, a documentary, uh, which we're in discussions about at the moment, um, called Mind Wars, about the uses and abuses of, of various psychological warfare uh, things. So um, you bringing this up about MK Ultra, uh, and that's why it jumped into my mind, because one of the th projects they asked me about was Havana Syndrome, um, and this, if you know what the Havana syndrome is, but also the, the thing of uh, voice to skull. So, yeah, it's yeah I, I, I'm getting it now. Ties in with the targeted people thing, doesn't it? There's a whole bunch of stuff about all of that. Yeah. Yeah. Let's let's do that in our next combo, which I am already looking forward to. It's so, been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. I hope you've got enough material to chop it together. Yes, for do, you, do you have any books out, Mark? Anything like this you'd like to promote? Uh, I've got a book out. It's called Hold Fast, which is actually, it came from um, black, my time in black sales where I had Hold Fast put on my knuckles, Mr. for Mr. Gates. Um, and the, it was suggested by the art department. They put Hold Fast. And um, it was, and it is basically the story of my life from me leaving the UK to uh, my 20 years in, in Los Angeles. And I'm going to probably do a follow-up to it, which is the first 20 years in London with Evita and Who Dares Wins and all that, Robin of Sherwood, again, which I mentioned, which I didn't really cover much in the book. So um, I wanted to cover the last 20 years. So I might go backwards now and cover more of that information. Um, I, I thought at the time that people wouldn't really be interested in it, but it turns out that people are more interested in that period of the 80s, so late 70s and 80s than, than I imagined. So... Hold Fast is my autobiography. That's how I've also written three books about the psychology of the imagery in tarot cards. So there's Wildwood Tarot, Greenwood Tarot, uh, Wild Magic, which is all about the synchronicity of tarot cards. That's a whole other conversation. To me, my therapies, we talked about that earlier on, um, was writing these books about human nature and human nature in 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 the natural world so tarot cards to me were my way of processing information in a way that i could manage it and understanding human human uh, nature so that's how it started and it was um it's been very successful so i mean wildwood tarot is probably one of the best selling tarot decks of the last 50 years 30 years anyway so anyway you know yes wildwood tarot greenwood tarot wild magic any of those books the pilgrim comic book graphic novel which is about psychic spies and about special forces people who uh, have um, special powers who were then recruited to do special work for the intelligence community. Uh, the Pilgrim is available. That's out there somewhere um, based on all kinds of things. Most of them, uh, you know, some of the things that we've just been talking about. My gosh, how fascinating. And um, yes, I'm not going to dive into why you've had to write these under your... Uh intelligence pseudonym but for people watching this is a man who uh, has had a past so we are just going to stick with the name mark ryan <laughs> um yes i'm going to say no more otherwise the boys you know, will be abseiling down my balcony it's and uh, the best it's the best it's for the best yes. trust me. i haven't even got a balcony so that's going to be interesting yeah, we'll still find a way through the front door with a Range Rover with a ladder on top, usually. But that's, you know. Mark, listen, stay on the line so I can thank you properly. But for the purposes of the recording, massive thanks, mate. I've absolutely thoroughly enjoyed this conversation um, and look forward to having many, many more. Um, I, I like to keep my hand in in Hollywood. Do you know what I'm saying? So, uh, yeah, it's a curious place. Yeah. You know, a lot of people knock it, but I have to be, it's been very kind to me. I mean, I mean that Hollywood and Los Angeles has been kind to me. I'll always be grateful for them welcoming me in and giving me a shot. My first shot was on Frasier, you know, the TV show Frasier. And, you know, I've always been grateful since. So I love it there. Southern California is fantastic. But anyway. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Thank you again, mate. To our friends at home, massive love to you all. Please. Look after yourselves. Please be kind to each other. And if you can like and subscribe, 
especially as I flash the flashy thing up three times then for you. Um, <laughs> I will love you even more. So see you next time. Thank you. Take care. Be well, everybody. Hello, friend. I hope this finds you well. My name's Chris Rule. I'm a former Royal Marines Commando, and I fought my way back from chronic trauma to live, work, and travel in 80 countries across all seven continents, achieving all of my dreams and goals along the way. Now, I pass my simple system on to other people, but I can only help you if you like and subscribe. So please do so because you get one life and if you live it right, one is enough.